This lecture is on working with misleading graphs, understanding when a graph is misleading and kind of understanding how um, graphs can be bad or good. Um, I'm talking about some bad graphs and some good graphs and how you can make better ones. So we're going to start off with some bad graphs. So the worst graphs are ones that are overly complicated. So this graph is really hard to understand. So this is looking at recessions. You'll see each color represents a different recession um, that the U.S. underwent and how many people lost their jobs. So the left axis goes through and shows you how many people lost their jobs in each recession um, in a number of months. There's all kinds of things wrong with this graph. It's really hard to understand. The time scale is strange. Um, the colors are close together. So graphs that distinguish just by color are bad because if you're colorblind, um, they're useless. So lots of things wrong with this graph, but mostly that it's overly complicated. Uh, the next one is even more complicated. So this is a graph that shows, it talks about the um, status of different economies. So each line here um, represents a different uh, country. You can see them all listed up and down the left side. Um, and then the years are at the bottom and you have to follow each country's line kind of through the graph. It's crazy, um, just kind of how bad this graph is. It really gives you no information. So that's the real problem with overly complicated graphs is nobody gets anything out of them. Um, it's, I mean, it's kind of pretty um, as like abstract artwork, but it doesn't really teach you anything. Oh, I went too far. So this is a graph with pictograms. Um, and so pictograms are kind of cutesy thing that people do sometimes in graphs, um, but they're not really great. So if you look at what happened here, um, between 1960 and, and 2000, the amount of trash that people produced grew from 100 um, tons, um, I think this is tons in this graph, though it's not labeled, which is another problem, to about 250. Um, but because they're using pictograms, if you look at the graphic in 2000, it's much, much larger than the graphic in 1960. Um, so it's two and a half times as tall, but it's about five or six times as big. And so pictograms have this problem that 2000 looks way, 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 way worse because that graphic is so much larger than the little graphic for 1960. Um, pictograms can have other problems. Um, so again, here's another example. Um, where the size of the pictograms is different for different things. So in each of these, uh, the people, the cows, the pigs, the sheep, all represent 5 million um, of something. Uh, but if you look at it, for example, in the United States, uh, there were, um, t say, like 22.5 million cattle. So there are 4.5 cows. Each cow represents 5 million cows. Um, so there are over this period that we're looking at, which was in the 1930s, there are 22 and a half million cows versus if you count the number of people images here, pictograms, there are nine people there. So that's nine times five is 45 million people. Okay. But it looks like a lot more cows because the cow pictogram is so much bigger, right? Even though there's actually half as many cattle, if you actually sit down and count them. So pictograms can be really, really misleading. Um, people like them because they think that they're a very kind of visual way of capturing something, but they can be super misleading um, if you look at them wrong. So bar charts. Bar charts are an old friend. Um, the biggest thing that you can do wrong with bar charts is to start your axis not at zero. Okay. So if you're making a bar chart, you should always start the vertical axis um, the axis on the side at zero. So you can see here, this is an example. This was a um, graphic from Fox News looking at what would happen if the Bush tax cuts expired, the tax cuts that President Bush had implemented in the 2000s, um, in 2013. And so you can see that the rate here would skyrocket. The second bar is so much bigger than the first one. But if you look at the percentages that are listed there, it's going from 35% to 39.6%. It's only going up by 4.5%. It's actually not that much. But because they started their bar chart at 34, on the right-hand side, you can see that the bottom of it is at 34. It looks like a lot more. 
So bar charts should always start at zero so that people can compare the heights of the bars in a way that's actually fair. The other thing that you can do with bar charts, um, so this is a bar chart of student grades. Um, so you can see it does start at zero, um, but you can see here that I'm skipping some categories. So it's got 20 to 30, and then it jumps right up to 60 to 70. So it looks here like the student grades are evenly distributed on kind of around 70 to, um, points, but it misses the fact that those people who got 20 to 30 are doing really poorly in the class. Whereas if you had had the 30 to 40 and 40 to 50 and 50 to 60 bars, which don't have anybody in them, but it would still give you that space. And you would see here that those students with 20 to 30 on their grades are doing very poorly. This is another graph of student grades. Um, these are the exact same numbers graphed in two different ways. On the left, you'll see that the far left bar, the lowest grade, is a bar that's all the grades from 0 to 50. Everybody who failed the exam with a 50 or below. Um, and that shouldn't just be one bar, right? Because that's much wider range than the others. So, right, you've got 0 to 50 in one and then 50 to 60. So 50 values versus 10 values. On the right is a better graph of this that gives a more realistic appearance of exactly how the grades are distributed, right? So you can see here that from the right, it looks most students passed. Um, there weren't that many students in that lower range um, because they're more spread out. So always keep your bars the same width, right? So if you've got 0 to 10 in one, 10 to 20 in the other, 20 to 30 in the other, not this 0 to 50 stuff, and don't skip any, okay? And always start the y-axis from 0. Pie charts. So pie charts can be pretty awful. This is a pie chart that represents the population of American states. This is awful for a lot of reasons. Um, for one thing, it's very hard to read because there's so much information here. And for the other thing, pie charts should really talk about percentages of a whole. Um, and while these are the percentages of the whole population of the US, there's just too many here um, to really give you anything realistic. Um, I mean, you can see a few things. If you look at this, for example, you can see that a quarter of the country, so a quarter of the circle, is made up of California, Texas, and New York. So a quarter of Americans live in California, Texas, and New York. Um, half live in the first, the top one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine states, uh, California down to Georgia. So half of the po population lives in those nine states. There are some things you can learn here, but in general, it's not very useful. Um, and so this isn't a great way to graph this data. This is another pie chart that's even worse. So what's the problem with this one? Well, if you look at this, the numbers, the percentages don't add up to 100%. They add up to 193%, okay? And so what's happening here is that in this, this was from the 2012 presidential election and who people were interested in voting for in the Republican Party. Um, and so the split that comes here is because some people supported more than one of these candidates. But you should never do this in a pie chart. In a pie chart, it's a representing a whole, okay? And so you should never have values that add up to more than 100%. Um, if you have data like this, maybe you represent it in a bar chart um, or something like that where people can get a better idea of what's going on. Uh, other things that graphs can do, this is one of my favorite graphs. This is um, We talked a little bit about this in one of the earlier lectures. So this is comparing the marriage rate in Wyoming to the number of cars sold. Um, and you can see they track very well. Uh, this is correlation, right? They correlate. They both are going down at very similar rates, but there's no causation. Um, so the number of cars sold isn't affecting the marriage rate. What's affecting both of them is the economy. So you can see this big dip in 2008, 2009. That's because the economy got worse in those years. Um, and so both people were less likely to get married, more likely to get divorced and less cars were sold. Um, using two different scales on the same axis. So this is a graphic that was used in the House of Representatives um, about abortion. Um, and the person who was presenting it wanted to show that Planned Parenthood um, was uh, doing more abortions and doing 
less cancer screenings. Um, and so that is true. What they were showing was not necessarily false, but the way that they're showing it is misleading. So you can see if you look at the numbers on these axes, um, the number of abortions, the number of cancer screenings, they don't make sense. Um, so you can see on the right, the number of cancer screenings is 935,000. The number of abortions is 327,000. So that 935,000 should be a lot further up than the 327,000 abortions. Um, the change in abortions is also a lot less. And so that shouldn't be going up quite as steeply as the other graphic is going down. Okay. So um, the person who was trying to show this was trying to show that Planned Parenthood was dedicating themselves to abortions. Um, what has actually happened um, over those years, and again, not to get into the politics of abortion, but uh, Planned Parenthood clinics had been uh, denied resources. A lot of states had passed laws um, withdrawing money from them that they used for cancer screening. And so that's a re lot of the reason why their cancer screening rates went down, whereas um, in many places, Planned Parenthood is the only abortion provider, and so the number of abortions didn't actually change that much because people still had to go there if that was what they wanted. So the graph, whether you agree with the person who's presenting it or not, the data is presented in a misleading way, uh, and that's what we want to focus on here. Um, the last graph I have here, this is a graph about something. I'm not sure what. I don't remember where I found this, but it's not labeled. Um, so it's very confusing what's going on here. There's vandalism, there's harassment. Um, we're not sure where this is, what these numbers represent, who they're talking about. You should always label graphs. You should say what the data is, where it came from, how you found it, what each axis represents, um, right? Number of incidents where. Uh, make sure you explain where your data is coming from because that's gonna help people understand what your graph is, okay? So these are just some of the things to watch out for with misleading graphs um, that people do both intentionally and accidentally. So I just wanted to give you kind of a view of kind of some of the bad things that you could do as far as how you display data.